started. Here we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this Saturday morning. My name is Carly Padilla, and I am the Project Wildlife Education Specialist, and you are with us today for our Wake Up With Wildlife for our April edition. Now, we really appreciate everyone attending today, and I knew we might have a few newbies here. So this is just a wildlife conservation talk that we hold the first Saturday of every month, unless there's a holiday that falls on that weekend. But um, this week, we're just going with it with Easter happening tomorrow. And so next month, we would love for you to join us as well. We actually have some another great speaker joining us from Project Coyote, talking about coyote awareness and all those lovely animals, coyotes around our area, and then coming in in June, we have raptors are the solution. So they're going to be talking about rodenticides and um, more humane ways to encourage those rodent friendly friends around the house to take off their departure without using rodent poison. Um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then just a little housekeeping. If you guys have questions or anything like that, please put them into the Q&A and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, I'm going to let Stan introduce himself and take it away. And I know we're all excited to learn about bird migrations. All right, Stan, all yours. Now, do I go to share a screen yet? Uh, yeah, uh, if you want to introduce yourself first and then share your screen, okay, we can go with that. That'll be fine. <laughs> okay, guys, my name is Stan Wallens, and I am not an ornithologist. I am a bird watcher or a serious bird watcher, and serious bird watchers um, call themselves birders. So if you hear that word, that means I am out every day looking at birds in the environment around me. I'm actually a psychological anthropologist and have and got interested in birds by mistake, by studying Native Americans who were interested in birds and having to learn what their birds were. As I told Carly, I have prepared about three and a half hours worth of talk today, and I want to get through at least some of it. Uh, so I'm going to get started on our talk right away. Um, Okay, so share screen. Share and slideshow. Whoops. Great. Perfect. Now um, I, I have a, um, a mouse that has a tendency to scroll really fast. So we might find pictures going back and forth really quickly, but I hope that won't happen. Okay. The word migration refers to a seasonal movement of a bird species from a breeding area to a wintering area, and then six months later back to a breeding area, usually in the spring, obviously. All kinds of birds have population movements of various kinds. Some of them just disperse short distances. Um, some of them um, may have eruptions. That's when the food source for a bird that usually stays resident in the north disappears and they may move further south. Um, it doesn't apply to movements that are non-seasonal. So if you get a bunch of birds that come down here in the winter and they live in your yard for two months and then they disappear and go to somebody else's yards, that's not migration. It even doesn't apply for some people to bird, for birds that move immense distances but it's not seasonal. For example, albatrosses fly about 100,000 miles a year, but it isn't spring and fall and winter and summer. It's just all the time. As a result, we don't call that migration. In North America, and actually in the old world too, bird migration is one of the most spectacular natural processes you can see. But if you're at one vantage point like San Diego or your backyard or Mount Soledad or the rocks on, on Point Loma, you can't really see it very often because the birds come through in small numbers or they, they migrate very high up in the air. So we have a tendency to not realize that there are billions of birds every year that are migrating through North America. Most of them migrate through the eastern two thirds, that is east of the Rockies. And I'll show you why when I show you a map. But some of them migrate west of the Rockies, and those are the ones we're going to be interested in today. 
Migration is a feat of incredible and unbelievable physical endurance, navigational skill, and adaptation to different environments. It actually takes place all year round. Every day of the year, there is migration taking place in North America and in San Diego. For birders, what's interesting to know is that every species or each individual species has its own migration calendar and it's fairly regular. We keep notes on when passerines move through and waterfowl and raptors. We keep migration calendars. We note the dates and numbers of birds coming through. We write to our friends, we read listservs, we enter our stuff on a giant civ civilian database called eBird. There is an enormous amount of information about when migrant birds are going to appear in a given area. I'll get into some of that in a little while. Now, I want you to understand that migration is actually the default state of life. Lots of animals, even single-celled animals, are able to orient themselves and navigate geographically. I don't know what your high school biology was like. It might have been all DNA and RNA and so forth. Back before the Civil War, when I was taking biology, we were watching planarias. And we had to watch these planarias migrate across petri dishes as we changed the factors that influenced the medium they were in. You could watch them move towards food or away from food or towards warmth or away from warmth or from each other. You could watch them move together. These are tiny, tiny microscopic flatworms. We know that bacteria migrate. We know that plankton migrates up and down in the water. We also know that there are lots and lots of other animals that migrate. Of course, salmon is one of the most famous and interesting in that some of the things that salmon might use to migrate, like the smell of the water that they are moving towards. Because as you know, salmon go back to the very stream they were born in. There are a lot of streams on, in the Northwest that have different uh, chemical makeups, but they also have different sounds. Sound, salmon may be listening to the sound of that particular stream coming up. They also orient by daylight. They know how far north or south they are how far east and west they are. They are able to absolutely pinpoint the entrance to a given river. Monarch butterflies, we know that monarch butterflies migrate and it's a fascinating migration in that the migration south takes one year, the migration north takes four years and each part of that year is a different generation. Salamanders migrate. Mostly they migrate, you know, not very long distances, maybe a couple of miles from feeding areas that tend to be drier to egg laying areas, which tend to be wetter. And of course, we've all watched videos of wildebeest in Africa trying to migrate across the Mara River. We know about whale migration. Gray whales are one of the highlights of San Diego migration. We also know about all the other whales that migrate, the map below. And I should say right now, I have, um, without crediting, stolen a lot of images from the internet. I have credits for all of them. I just didn't put them in here. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a humpback migration pattern. Humpbacks have a three year migration pattern. They, they breed in one of three winter breeding areas. They move up to the Arctic to feed, they give birth. They go back to the winter breeding area to raise their young for the second year. And then they move back to the Arctic separately from their young the third year, and then move back to the winter breeding area to breed the next. Um, so humpback migration occurs here and blue whale migration at a different time than gray whale migration. In fact, it's gonna start Gray whales are migrating north right now. Humpbacks are going to start migrating past us in about a month. Blue whales will be here in July. 
migrating from Chile up to Alaska. Oops, wrong way. All right. What I've just told you about whales is they need different ecological niches for breeding than they do for feeding. The same is true for birds. Birds may breed in one area because it provides really good food to raise young, but it's not a great area to find food during the winter. As a result, because of the climatic changes in North America, a lot of birds have to move out of their breeding areas from the summer where they are able to feast on huge amounts of insects. And if you don't, if you haven't been to Alaska in the summer and seen mosquitoes so thick that you cannot see, or gone to the north of Canada and been eaten by black flies, you don't realize just how many bugs there are up there that provide food for all the birds that are down, that are up in the north. And the reason for that is that all that sunlight spurs plant growth and all that light also spurs warmth and the insects hatch in, in enor enormous, yes, ginormous numbers more than humans like, but great for insect eating birds. Unfortunately, if you are eating these Alaskan mosquitoes, they disappear in about August and you don't have anything left to eat and you have to move somewhere where there are still insects or seeds to eat. <coughs> and of course, once the winter comes, it's freezing cold and everything is ice and there's just no place to sit and be in protection. So the major point of bird migration and is fairly obvious and sensible is that birds move north in the summertime to take advantage of extra daylight, extra light that enables them to hunt for more time, more hours of the day. And at the same time, the food blooms that happen in the north, but then they have to move south because those food blooms disappear and light disappears and they do not have enough time to find food. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in addition, I know that this is gonna sound strange. There are a lot of birds in the tropics. There's a lot of competition with other birds. If you can migrate to the north into that vast area of Canada and Alaska and Greenland and Northern Europe, you spread out. There isn't as much competition for food as there is in the tropics. There also isn't as many predators. If you've ever been to Central or South America, you know you spend a lot of your time hiking, looking for snakes because they're there and they are hungry and they are everywhere and they love to eat birds. If you go to Alaska, there are no snakes. There are foxes and there are wolves and there are other predators like um, other birds, but there aren't millions and millions of snakes looking for eggs and young. We think that migration probably started as a process at the end of the last ice age. <coughs> and that as, excuse me a second, As the ice caps retreated and the, and the world began to warm up in the north, birds began moving further and further north with each year until they first started with only maybe 20 or 30 miles of migration. And eventually it becomes an extraordinarily long migration. Migration south, which is what we'd love to see because it's when the most birds are alive, is influenced by the length of daylight. Birds have, as you know from handling them, have extremely thin bones, especially in their skulls. And underneath their skull bones are all these different glands that can react to light. And as those glands get more and more light or less and less light, they produce hormones. 
one of those hormones, and you don't need to know the name, <coughs> excuse me, it's allergy season here in San Diego. Um, one of those hormones induces something called Zugenruhe, a German word which is translated as migratory restlessness, restlessness. And migratory restlessness is exhibited by the fact that birds will begin fluttering their wings constantly. They can't fall asleep. They're up all the time. Instead of feeding, they begin flying around and dropping to the ground and flying around and flying around. And even more, they eat like pigs. They eat so much food that they double their weight during the course of about three to four weeks. Migratory restlessness is known in virtually the entire animal kingdom from single celled animals all the way up through humans. And if you ever wanna see migratory restlessness, it works. As you can see from my notes, just go to Florida on spring break because you see all these creatures running around restless, constantly fluttering their wings, showing off, unable to sleep and really packing on calories. All that beer and pizza adds up. So the first thing that influences bird migration, and this is the most important, is changes in length of daylight influence hormonal production, which causes anxiety. In fact, Zugenru actually means migratory anxiety and causes the birds to begin wanting to fly. The next thing that happens is of course, in the summer and fall, the weather changes, barometric pressure changes, Birds have an enormous ability to sense all kinds of things that we don't, or we don't express, uh, we don't know very well. My mom used to say that she knew when a storm was coming because her arthritis hurt. Barometric pressure is something that birds can sense from a thousand miles away. They can sense a storm coming when it's a thousand miles away and prepare to move on the front that's coming through. Another thing that birds use is infrasound. This is sound that's below 16 Hertz a minute. It's below what humans can hear, which is 16 Hertz a minute. We know that a whole group of animals, especially elephants and uh, sea mammals can hear sound that's below 16 Hertz a minute. This is the sound the earth makes as it is rotating. This is the sound that earthquakes make before they erupt. This is the sound of wind against the mountains. <coughs> this is the sound of water moving through a river. Not the high sounds we can hear, but sounds so low that they can be sensed by us only, actually the humans relate, re response to infrasound is terror. We think that birds can sense infrasound and know when there are major changes to the world coming through. Of course, they can also sense that there are temperature changes, temperature changes, it gets colder as the fall comes and they begin to need more food in order to survive a day. We know that birds have great senses of smell. Some birds do, some birds can't smell anything. Um, as you know, from handling great horned owls, they love skunks. And I don't know how they put up with it, but they can smell like skunk so much that we can't go near them, but they just go and love to eat skunks. But lots of birds, especially seabirds, which are my specialty, um, use olfactory cues to find what's happening in the world. And this can mean not only that other birds are moving past and they smell them, it can mean there's a change in the smell of the land as, it, as plants stop growing. They can react to the fact that they're no longer blooming flower odors. There are all kinds of things that they can smell. They can smell the change of ions in the air. Um, all these things can be read at one time. And of course, the last thing that influences migration is that food disappears. 
And as food becomes harder and harder to find, birds move south towards where there's more food. Here's a picture of Zugenruba. These are tree swallows. Tree swallows are migrating through San Diego right now. They began migrating through in early March, there, though there were some of them as early as January. And they're still coming through in giant numbers. But you can see these birds just kind of sitting on plants, beating their wings, looking around, getting ready to fly. I know that we all get spring fever. It's the same thing. If you don't want to call it spring fever anymore, be a biologist and call it Zugenrua. The most spectacular visual of Zugenrua is starling murmurations. I know you've seen videos of these, and I'm going to show you one, where a million or two million starlings can fly around at one time, an astonishing pattern. They're not migrating, they're getting ready to migrate. They're learning to migrate as a group. They're learning to feel the air. They're learning to know how to react to other starlings. They're learning how to use the air that comes off other birds' wings to get extra lift. This would make a great screensaver. Okay. Now, we all love to think about those birds that make the longest distance migrations. And the one that everyone talks about, of course, is Arctic Tern. It will fly from the extreme north of Alaska all the way to the Antarctic Ocean every year. It does not fly directly. It may cross the Atlantic and come back and then go back to Africa and then come around. It may go across land, it may come back, which is why though the earth is only 25,000 miles around and therefore if it went directly, the, the, um, the turn should fly 12,000 miles south and 12,000 miles north. It actually covers an enormously long distances. Sooty shearwaters, one of my favorite birds, fly from New Zealand and Australia up around Japan, up to the uh, Bering Sea, and then down past California, down past South America, and back to New Zealand every year. Weed ears, and, and weed ears are approximately the size of a, a large sparrow fly 18,000 miles a year. And one of my favorites, Adelie penguins, swim 11,000 miles a year in their migration. A number of birds migrate through by swimming, including things that are called alcids, relatives of puffins. We see a lot of alcids on, in California, um, and they will mostly fly, but also some of them just swim south. The great auk now extinct used to swim from Norway to New Jersey every year and then back. American golden plovers. Now, forget, forget the things in these maps that say permanent residents. There are no permanent residents. You can see the red where they breed up in the taiga and the tundra. That is the almost treeless north and the treeless north fly south through the yellow areas, we get a very small number of them west of the Rockies. Most of them fly east of the Rockies. Then down through America, through Mexico and through South America to the southern coast of, our, of Brazil and Uruguay and other South American countries. This is a bird that's about 10 inches long. I know you handle birds, you know that they weigh nothing. It probably weighs about six to eight ounces. And it flies, as you can see, approximately 10,000 miles to get to its breeding area, from its breeding area to its wintering area, and then 10,000 miles back to its breeding area. 
the black pole warbler. This is, I know you handle warblers. They are, they're like the size of goldfinches. They're that tiny. One of the most important birds in American history, and I'll tell you why. They breed, as you can see, in the boreal forest. Somewhere in August, they begin moving southeast till they come to the Atlantic Ocean. Some of them move south through the southeastern states, but a large number of them actually moved out of the northeast states out and migrate out over the ocean as much as 300 miles. They are using the west winds that are pushing them east and using the extra speed of those winds to, to cut down on the energy they need to use until they get far enough out in the ocean that they pick up the trade winds that blow them southwest. And the reason black pole warblers are important, by the way, they will fly a total of 3,000 miles nonstop over the ocean. The reason they're important is that they're migration over the ocean is in early October. And in 1492, Columbus, 400 miles off the coast of North America, began seeing black pole warblers flying past him. And he knew that where there were birds flying, there was land they were flying towards. So he turned his boats southwest towards the Caribbean, following the Black Pole Warblers until he landed in the Dominican Republic. It wasn't Columbus or Leif Erikson who discovered America. It was the Black Pole Warbler guide who did that. Black Pole Warblers between the time that they leave land and arrive in, in Northeastern South America, may fly continuously for six days at a speed of about 25 miles an hour. They travel 2,000 miles, they fly over the water. The longest migration that is nonstop is the bar-tailed godwit. It breeds in Alaska on the, on the coastal slope. It takes off from the coastal slope and it flies to New Zealand without stopping. It flies without food, rest, or water for nine days, 7,000 miles. And then does the return trip in the spring. And one of the great birds of North America, and this is, this is a concept I wanted to teach you. Not all birds make these long nonstop migrations. And this is why San Diego is important. Lots of birds have to stop along the route and use areas that they can use to refuel or rest. And we call these areas staging areas. San Diego is very important as a staging area for birds migrating south to South America or to Asia. One of the most interesting birds that uses staging areas, and we get some of these in San Diego, is the red knot. There's a beautiful book about red knots called Moonbird follows a single red knot through its lifetime. In spring, they fly from Southern Argentina, which you see down here, up through South America. They cross the Atlantic Ocean, landing in various places in North America, the most important of which is Delaware Bay. In Delaware Bay, they may spend up to three weeks feeding before they migrate north to the tundra to breed. And what they're feeding on is horseshoe crab eggs. 
you can see from the number of birds here just how important these horseshoe crab eggs are to sustaining the red knot. But there are problems. Horseshoe crab blood is very important medically. It's used as a reagent in a lot of tests. It has not been synthesized very well. And as a result, there is an industry collecting horseshoe crabs at such a rate that they are becoming threatened. As their numbers disappear, so do the numbers of red knots. And one reason, another reason that staging areas are endangered is this is what the red knot Delaware Bay habitat looks like starting in the middle of May when the red knots are there. Any place that's a staging area for birds is often a staging area for humans. They sit, they rest, they eat, they get to know one another, and they then move back. This is what's happening to the red knot population. As you see, in 1990, there were almost 100,000 red knots in Delaware Bay. In 2006, there were 16,000, and it has not recovered. One of the interesting things about red knot, now we think of bird migration as just kind of being something we can see because they're only above the ground and you know, we see birds flying near us. Most bird migration takes place at extremely high altitudes, usually between 2,000 and 20,000 feet. And the reason for that is that surface winds are not very strong, but upper air winds can be really strong. So red knots, for example, fly at 15,000 feet. They like to use winds that are 50 miles an hour in, in magnitude. This means that during a day of flying 24 hours at 50 miles an hour, they get 1,200 miles of extra distance covered. Even so, they now spend about six weeks doing their 18,000 mile trip. Okay. Migration's a really complicated. Oh, this is my this is a wonderful bird. This is we're talking about staging areas. I missed seeing the only one in North America by approximately six minutes in British Columbia. Spoon spoon billed sandpiper breeds in the Arctic in Russia. It stages in one marsh in China, which is endangered. There are fewer than 300 of them in the world. And luckily for us, there are a lot of Chinese bird watchers. And there's some interest in trying to save this marsh before it's filled in and built over. I'm going to skip boom bills for now. Fascinating birds. OK. 60 years ago or 70 years ago, we knew very little about how birds migrate. And the reason for this is, as I said, they migrate very high up in the air. We don't see a lot of them migrating. Some of them we can see when they come down towards land during the day, or we can see them as they're in their wintering areas, but the actual migration process is very difficult. And if we think about that picture of the snow geese, how do we know that those are the same individuals in that area that came last year or the year before or will come back next year? They all look exactly the same, at least to us. They look different to one another. And for many years, for almost a century, the only way we had to track birds was through bird banding. I started out back in the, in the 70s doing bird banding. And that means you put up a net, you catch a bird, and then you put a little metal or plastic band on it. And when I started, there, was no there were no plastic bands. And then you hope, hope, hope that someone who's a bird bander will catch that bird somewhere else and tell you 
where they were. Unfortunately, bird banding recovers approximately one tenth of one percent of the birds that have been banded. That's one in a thousand. So it's a particularly ineffective way to know a lot about birds. You get some idea, you know, if you bird a band and band a bird in California, and it appears that someone has shot it in Bolivia, you know that these birds go to Bolivia. And, and for a long time, that was the only data we had. Then, as birding became more popular, and especially as sharing bird data became more popular, and that really required, first of all, publications and then computers, birders, even though they don't like one another and are very competitive, talk to one another, and they report to one another what they're seeing. And they like to be the first person to see a bird that's migrating each season. And so birders like to produce reports. I've got 40 years of birding reports on <coughs> seabird populations in La Jolla Cove. And I am happily proud to lord them over other people. Recently, over the last two dozen years, there's been a development called eBird. This is a computer database that's crowdsourced and all birders who belong to it enter their bird reports from wherever they were. And those get sent to a central computer and all of this produces big data. It's become incredibly important in knowing when birds appear and when they stay and what numbers are around. It's really been a major influence on our knowledge of bird migration and population. Then there are censuses. The most important census is the Audubon Christmas count. For 130 years now, every Christmas season for three weeks, birders go out and they count the number of birds in a given restricted territory during one day. So let's say that our Christmas count in San Diego in a 15, it's a 15 mile in circumference circle and its uh, center is kind of down in National City or a little north of that. Um, about a hundred birders, it's a, San Diego has a big Christmas count, about a hundred, 120 birders go out. I've been on a Christmas count in Nome, Alaska in which there were three birders. So obviously we're getting very, very different bird counts. Of course, in Nome, Alaska at Christmas, it was totally dark. And I think the only birds we saw were ravens. But this Christmas count, these birders go out and try to count every bird they can find in this territory. It's great in that we have a century and a quarter worth of data about each of these Christmas count circles. The problem is reporters, are they accurate? Is the, is the count circle in the right place? Maybe they're missing a very important staging area. There are huge areas of space between where the count circles are. There might be a count circle in South San Diego and the next one is in Del Mar. And yet the area between downtown San Diego and Del Mar can have thousands and thousands of birds that are not being counted. What about if someone decides they wanna go owling and this year they spent eight hours owling in the dark and they counted 12 owls and next year they go out and they're not feeling good and they spend an hour in the dark and they don't see any. What does that mean for owl populations? It produces data that is very iffy. So, and, and, and finally, here's the real problem with Christmas counts. Nobody knows how to count large flocks of birds. How many snow geese were in that picture that I showed you? I guarantee that if I had 10 birders there, I would get 10 wildly different numbers from 200 to 2000. So this, this censusing is really, 
um, uh, a mediocre way of finding out what birds have migrated to different places. Another kind of census is censusing at very limited areas where birds concentrate. Birds may be at a staging point and you do to that staging point every day. That's why I'm at La Jolla three days a week because it's a feeding area for a lot of seabirds. Or a transit point like Point Pelee or um, a Hawk Mountain where birds come through and we know that these are areas that birds use. And these funneling areas, though they might be limited by geo geography, are very important. Okay, I'm gonna get back to those funneled areas in a minute. Let me just go through the next way that we migrate, we track migrant birds. Really the most important thing that's happened in bird migration studies is radar. And since the 1970s, radar has been getting better and better we can now track individual bird species. We can track individual insect species as they migrate through North America. Another thing that we can do is we can put radio transmitters or GPS transmitters on the birds as they get micro miniaturized and actually follow a bird using satellites or radio towers as it migrates past each station. One thing birders love to do is go out on a full moon and watch birds flying across the face of the moon and trying to identify them, or trying to identify them by the calls they make as they fly. And a new, a new thing that's just come out is a, a light level geolocator. This uses light from the sun as it comes in polarized to tell exactly within about 60 feet where a bird is at any given time. Now, for a long time, we talked about birds having very, very basic migration routes, four of them across North America. Oh my gosh, my time's almost up. I'm up to page three out of 19. I hope you guys have nothing to do today or tomorrow. Um, and the four were the Eastern, which you see on the right, the, the Mississippi, the Rocky, and the Pacific. And they were looked like they were separate. Unfortunately, we now know that birds use, and this map is unreadable. It's meant to be on your wall and, and take up the entire wall. We can now see that birds use enormously complex patterns of migration going east and then south and then north and then west and then east again, moving in different patterns in different ways. This is a rendition of the normal migration patterns of North American shorebirds. And you can see they go all over the place. There's also, and this is my favorite, uh, migration corridor, the Pacific migration corridor, very important in California. You can see that there are birds that circumnavigate the entire Pacific Ocean every year. There are also, by the way, fish that do the same thing. This is, this is, um, oh, I just forgot the name, Monterey Bay. And it's very, very important for great white sharks because off of Monterey Bay are the Farallon Islands where great white sharks love to fe feast on seals. They then swim south, whoops, pick up the equatorial current, swim to Japan, give birth, swim back and eat seals. By the way, they also give birth in La Jolla Cove. That's a major, uh, birthing area for great white sharks. Now we talked about long distance migration. There's also leapfrog migration. This is where one population may move just a short distance and other populations may move a long distance. Leapfrog migration is very important in San Diego. Okay, I talked about censusing. This is an area in Veracruz that funnels hawks. 
you've got three seconds, how many hawks of how many species are in there and imagine them moving and you trying to count them. This is why what a biologist will do is simply set up his camera, take a picture every one second and then spend, put it in the computer. But if you have birders doing this, get wildly different numbers. 325, by the way. And these areas where birds stage like Hawk Mountain are very popular. Now in San Diego, one of the great staging areas is Borrego Springs. Swainson's hawk migrate up into Borrego Springs every March. The, the Swainson's hawk migration is just ending from maybe the 10th of March to the 5th of April or so, uh, actually the 7th of April, numbers of Swainson's hawks will come through um, Borrego Springs. And they're coming through at the time when there's a super bloom of possible because the caterpillars of white line sphinx moths will feed on these plants. White line sphinx moths produce acid in their bodies, which makes them taste. And yes, we biologists have, have, have eaten them. And as a Native American, the Native Americans used to clean them out and then roast them. They're perfectly nutritious if you get rid of the acid. They taste like vomit. But Swainson's hawks, for some reason, will eat them by the hundreds. And you can go to Borrego Springs during these weeks and see this Swainson's hawks being funneled through the valley. They're making a trek of maybe 6,000 miles from South America up to the plains of North America, the Great Plains. They will ride, they will land in the, uh, at night they come down, so, I'm sorry, let me start that again. They spend every day in the morning feeding on sphinx moth caterpillars. They then ride thermals, which are bubbles of hot air that are created by flat land, takes them up to about 5,000, 6,000 feet. And then they ride the high winds north, east to their California Central Valley and Great Plains habitats. They will fly all day long until the afternoon when it cools off, then they will drop down and feed again. They feed for a short time, go to roost in, in trees in, the, in Borrego Springs, it's in the eucalyptus groves. Then in the morning, they will get out, use thermals a little while to go to the feeding areas, feed for a little part of the morning, and then pick up the thermals and move further. Back in about 1980, maybe a hundred Swainson's hawks came through Borrego Springs every year. Now it's up to approximately 20,000. And what's interesting here is that somehow Swainson's hawks learned in those 30, 40 years that the Borrego Valley was a good place to feed in. This is a learned behavior. And I don't know if there are any articles on how Swainson's hawks actually learn things. But they'll eat these, these caterpillars, by the way, are fat. And the Swainson's hawks can really recoup their, uh, their, uh, their body weight eating them. I'm rushing, 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 rushing through. My wife said, you always have five times more than you need. And she was right. Every day that, during the march, there are birders out there counting Swainson's hawks in every direction. Now, the next, as I said, the greatest thing in bird migration studies has been radar. We can know the night before whether or not there's going to be a bird migration in any given area. This is a map that shows you weather and bird migration moving in front of the weather. But, and I didn't put a lot of videos in, this is what the map looks like on a given day. Um, as you watch birds take off at dusk and begin to migrate.
you can see huge numbers of birds taking off and the, and the actual minute that they take off and how they congregate and how they flock. I'm gonna show you this one again, because I want you to look at, oops. All right, I don't know why that's happening. I want you to look at California over here on the left. A lot of birds in the Central Valley, very few on the coast, some on the Channel Islands. Seabirds that you can see here migrate, mostly gulls and, and uh, pelicans and cormorants, migrating out of the Farallons. But look how the birds funnel down here, south of the, of the San Gabriels, and then move down the coast or through the desert. Then as, as dawn comes, the birds all disappear. Okay. Another way we, mi we monitor migration is that various bird sites actually give you daily counts of what they see, what the wind was like, what time each bird picked up, and so forth. These staging areas, these migration points, excuse me, very, very popular with birders. This is a picture of a, a, a European robin that occur, occurred in Beijing. And you are looking at maybe 200 birders, each one with a camera that cost $20,000 or $25,000. Uh, birding in China has become incredibly popular among the upper classes. Uh, it's just, and, and if you want to really see a lot of birders looking at something, go to Britain. Another way that we're doing following birds is putting radio transmitters on their back. This is great for large birds because they can handle, handle a few ounces of, of radio transmitter, but you can't use it for small birds. For small birds, you have to miniaturize it. And then we do have miniaturized. This is a great picture of birds moving across the, the moon. Mostly what you do is you see one every 10 minutes. But imagine trying to count birds as they migrate past the moon. There are hazards for birds as they migrate. The most important one, well, the second most important one is lights. Birds migrate by orienting themselves to the sun, to the stars, by using electromagnetism, they have iron particles in the, in the bones of their skull and in their nose, and those move and as they cross uh, various lines of electromagnetism. They use polarized light. Uh, they note the angle of the sun as it moves through the sky. They have all kinds of ways of uh, tracking where they are, and they can make, make differences, but in modern life, we produce an enormous amount of light. And so areas that produce light are death traps to birds. The birds find the light, move towards it, and cannot escape from it. The Washington Monument is one of the worst buildings in the world for creating bird deaths. The 9-11 memorial lights in New York City a bird will get into the light beam and just fly around and fly around until it dies. Unfortunately, nobody turns off the lights at the Washington Monument, nor have they thought of turning it into colors that birds won't respond to. But luckily, in New York, there are monitors from the Audubon Society, and if they see a certain number of birds in the lights, they will have the lights turned off for 20 minutes. But this is what it looks like in the morning outside a building where birds crash into the lights or the glass. We don't know exactly how many birds are killed by glass collisions every year. It's estimated to be in the hundreds of millions. Um, next week at Los Angeles Audubon, there is a talk on 
minimizing bird collisions and glass. San Diego is very poor at minimizing bird collisions. Wind turbines. This is a big one for birders because, of course, we want to move towards efficient energy and move away from carbon-based energy, but they can be, I said, death traps, death traps for birds. It looks like wind turbines move very slowly, but if you measure the tip of each turbine vane, it's actually moving at 180 miles an hour. So during migration, when the winds are really good for bird migration, it would be good for energy too, it would be great if wind turbines can be turned off. It's not a good thing that we want to put a lot of wind turbines out over the ocean because there are a lot of birds that migrate over the ocean. Another thing that happens is environmental pathogens. Um, these are some of the 600 loons found on one beach that died because they got avian botulism from algae that was uh, in the water of the lake they landed on. And I'm not going to talk about this because you're the Humane Society, but um, this is something that more arguments happen about than in any other part of bird conservation. Predation by feral and pet cats is enormous. And we, we can yell at each other for, for years about this. I don't know what the solution is going to be. I'm not going to get into that. I just wanted to mention it. This is the leading cause of death for migrant birds. And hunting and fishing. The cormant on the left has swallowed something like 20 fish hooks. It did not survive, by the way. On the right is a picture of Hawk Mountain when it was believed that you could shoot any hawk you wanted because they were predators. If you go to Mexico or other places where there are very large limits, they are places where bird numbers are really impacted. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move really fast now. Just some numbers. We know that some 4 billion birds move south every fall from Canada. They're joined by about another billion that have bred in North America. That makes close to 5 billion birds that move to South America. Only 3.5 billion come back. And of those, only 2.5 billion make it back to Canada. So we're seeing at least a one third or two fifths loss of birds every year during migration. They they, uh, let me just say this. There's no way that our bird populations can sustain this. We are watching catastrophic collapses of bird populations throughout North America in all zones. So I think we'll just go about 10 minutes over if you guys are OK. San Diego is important as a staging area and breeding area for a number of species. The most important, elegant and least terns. And you can see elegant terns moved up here at the beginning of March. They will breed here through July. Then they will fly back to Mexico for the winter. And snowy plovers, on your screen, this is about 10 times the size of a snowy plover. Um, gorgeous little birds that need very specific habitats. They need flat sand that the tide has cleared of vegetation. And they like to be in areas that humans like to be in. So they have to be fenced off. This is a least California least tern in the 1970s. They were one of the first birds to be listed on the Endangered Species Act list. It is about seven inches long, beautiful little bird, very delicate flyer. In the 1970s, there were 600 of these left. Now there are about 14,000. And though that's a great number, it's not enough to sustain the population. Breeding areas for California least tern are San Diego and Oceanside, one site in 
Orange County at Bolsa Chica, a few marshes up north of Los Angeles, and now a few marshes between um, Santa Maria area and San Francisco. Very sparse mating, uh, breeding areas. They have to be prepared. The vegetation has to be mowed down. That's what we see on the left. On the right, that we have to poison invasive vegetation. Predators have to be trapped. Cages have to be built so that the birds don't be killed while they're sitting on the nest. And there are a number of partners that are important in this. A lot of people get involved in turn and plover management. I'm not gonna list them all. If you go to Audubon um, and look up turn management, you'll see a, a two page list of what agencies are involved. It includes there are some turn breeding spots now maintained at the airport. Very small, only four to six nests, but it can be important for creating new areas. And then if you're lucky and you've created the right habitat, you get these beautiful little birds. They have to be banded. They have to be me measured. If they're killed, as you can see, there is turn bands over here on the right. You wanna know what killed them. You have to capture them. And that's, uh, these pictures, by the way, are from Linda Goodenough, who's on the right, and Bob Patton, my friend, who's on the left, catching an elegant turn to put bands on it, to weigh it, to, to measure the, the um, here's Bob putting a radio transmitter on a turn. It's solar powered, so you see some solar cells on it. It'll last for about a year before the bird molts its feathers. So you can use it for one year. And by using these radio transmitters, we can see that elegant turns move up and down the entire coast between San Francisco and Southern Peru. And gold-billed terns, which breed in San Diego, where you see this conflict, conf, uh, conflux of lines, fly down the Gulf of California till they get to Southern Mexico. Now, we have just a few minutes. We have just some of the great spectacular birds. I've, I'm leaving so much out. Uh, there are great books on bird migration if you want to read about it. The Atlas of Bird Migration. There's a, a new book called, oh gosh, I just forgot the name of it. I'm number 22 on the wait list. A new bird on, mar, mar, on bird migration coming out. Every bird, every book on bird migration is called something of the wind. Um, there are lots of videos on YouTube that show bird, bird migration, especially bird migration in, in the Gulf. Because as you can see here on the map, as soon as a bird moves, let's say a bird moves, breeds up here in Alaska, if it goes straight south, it ends up in the mountains. So they tend to move east and then south, coming through the Great Plains. They come through the Great Plains, they can move through Mexico, or they can save time by moving across the Gulf of Mexico. Because remember, South America is east of, the, of North America. So they're actually moving this way. But there's a, great, a bunch of great videos on YouTube about Gulf migration. But here are a few migrants that are going through right now that you have a chance of seeing. Hooded Orioles are about the first migrant that comes in San Diego from the south. They arrived about two weeks ago. Stragglers came in earlier than that, but now if you have a, an Oriole or hummingbird feeder up, you should be seeing them at your feeders. As you can see, they, they, they nest here throughout California and throughout parts of Nevada and Arizona and they will move down through Mexico into South America for the winter. Western tanagers began appearing two days ago. Uh oh, if you need a list of when birds are expected to appear, the San Diego Bird Atlas, which was done in 2000, has migration dates and limits. It's, it's available for free on the San Diego Natural History Museum 
website and copies are at the library. There are also updates that are available through various bird listservs. And uh, I'll give you my email uh, later. Actually, I'll give you my email now. It's stanwallens at gmail.com. If you want to email me and ask me questions, then I can send you links to the updates to the Atlas. Western tanagers, as I say, are coming in right now. I haven't seen one yet. Um, I watch every morning for them. Birds fly at night a lot of the time because it's cooler and their flying uses a lot of energy. They produce a lot of heat. And then as it becomes dawn, they land and then they feed for a couple hours. And then as it heats up, they take up and go high and then fly again. So the best time to see birds that are migrating through is dawn through about 8.30. By 8.30, but you can watch the birds getting restless. You can see the Zugan Rua, and you can see them begin taking off, flying higher and higher, and then just disappearing. So from dawn until 8.30, I tend to be out, as the other birders are, looking for these birds. Beautiful little birds that are going to migrate through San Diego. They do breed in the mountains, but there are not very many of them. They tend to be more northern breeders. Western kingbirds have moved in. I just watched a flock of 13 on a wire outside my house this morning. Uh, lovely little, little birds. Tree swallows I mentioned can come through in huge numbers, especially in January. They fly all, they fly during the day because they're feeding during their migration. Other birds do not feed during their migration. Warblers. Lots and lots of different kinds of warblers. Townsend's warbler and hermit warbler are the two most common, along with yellow rumped warbler. They migrate from South America and, and Central America up to, in this case, hermit warbler, the Pacific Northwest, and Townsend's warbler, British Columbia and Alaska. It, it, we don't have time to compare the two maps, but it's interesting in how some hermit warblers appear in really weird places as vagrants. Townsend's warblers don't, except for the fact that there are two from the Bahamas. Wandering tattler breeds up in Alaska, migrates down to, Argent uh, to Chile and Peru, and there are two of them in La Jolla. They, they live on the rocks, great birds to watch. San Diego is a great place for shorebird migrants and winter residents. These are at the South Bay and we don't have time to talk about South Bay restoration plans. Loon migration, one of my favorites. In October, November, you can watch a half a million Pacific loons flying past La Jolla over the course of six weeks. Most I ever saw was three and a half 350,000 in a day, beautiful birds. Sea ducks, which migrate right over the ocean, so you can actually watch them migrate. And shearwaters, my favorite birds, city, sooty shearwaters, which migrate from New Zealand to Alaska and then back. An iconic bird of San Diego, the black vented shearwater, call that because underneath the tail, the feathers are black. My, breeds on Isla Raza in Mexico. La Jolla Cove is its major wintering area. Major population losses for both of these birds. This is what sooty shearwater migration looks like if you're on a boat. This is what it looks like if you want to. Okay, I want you to count the number of birds going past. Your experienced bird counters by now. This goes on 24 hours a day for weeks. Okay, and that's it, bird migration. So I see we have a couple of questions and answers. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop the video. Oh my gosh, Stan, that was amazing. We should have given you an hour and a half. I'm so sorry. There uh, just... <laughs> uh, okay. I, uh, 
I'm screen sharing and I don't want to stop share. There we go. There we yes, go. I, I'm sorry. I skipped so much. I, I really did have enormous amount of stuff about how they read the weather, how they use smells, how uh -huh. they... Uh, it's a it's a hefty topic. It's a, it it's not a it's not a quick talk, but a good majority of our participants have stayed on. So thank you guys so much. Um, we do have one question in here, Stan. Is that <laughs> Kathy mentioned she loved your passion and knowledge, and do you ever lead sessions as in outings or hikes for novice bird learners? Yes, um, we are obviously, as you know, in the middle of a coronavirus problem. All. Of, if this was a normal year, I would say the Audubon Society here is very active. They have three walks a week. They love novices. They are really friendly. They don't care if you have, can I tell in a house finch from a, from a heron? They, it's a great way to start. They are just starting up bird walks now but they are limiting them to eight to 10 people. So if you go to the Audubon site, you can sign up for them. You do not have to be an Audubon member to go on one of these hikes, but they're very competitive. I do, I do, I mean, they won't be, but it's when the, when the pandemic has lessened and we can go out with one another, then um, yes, there'll be bird hikes all over the place. I do lead bird hikes. I'm, I'm hearing impaired, so I'm not the great person, the greatest person for looking for migrating birds. I see them faster than anybody, but I don't hear them. But what I would suggest you do is there are some, is, as I said, birds are funneled for normal, for, through some spots. A great spot for watching bird migration here is the top of Mount Soledad, because birds are flying all night long. The sun comes up, they see this mountain, it's got trees on it, they land to feed. And you can see them feeding for an hour and a half and then they take off. And they, as I said, they then use the heat to rise and rise and rise. So it was between about 6.30 and 8.30, you and a bunch of other birders will be out there trying to find the birds in the trees and flying past. That's where I would start. In the fall, I am out at, at a point, uh, sorry, called Point La Haya. It's La Haya Cove almost every day of the week in the mo early morning watching seabirds migrate. And if there's a storm, I might be there all day long. Seabird migration is, as you saw, spectacular. Um, another place to go is, and I know it's a little far, is uh, the Salton Sea. That's a great migration place. And it will be for maybe another five to 10 years. Uh, before the sea dies. Uh, and you're still asking about hikes. There are four, sorry, three major Audubon societies here, San Diego, Buena Vista, and Palomar. They all lead bird hikes. I would go to their website. For me leading a hike, yeah, I'm happy to lead a hike anywhere. Oh, another place to go look. Birds like to migrate where the wind comes up. So that means along the sides of mountains. So if you go to the western flank of the mountains or the eastern flank of the mountains because if the wind is blowing east it pushes birds up onto the eastern slope of the lagunas and just sit there you can watch birds go lots of birds migrate through the desert and and uh okay i just told you where you can go without me because at this point <laughs> no one is leading bird trips but if you keep up with what audubon is doing sooner or later we will all be out there doing that Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Stan, and then someone just mentioned, come back again, your passion is great. We really appreciated your time today. Um, thank you again, everyone for joining us this Saturday morning. Uh, okay. I, I'll send out an email and if Stan, if you wanna send me any of those links that you talked about um, to the history, I, will do that. I can send that out as I uh, do a little follow up, but that's it for today, everyone. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. One second. Oh. I, will, I will send you the links and I will send you the titles of the books whose names I have just forgotten. <laughs> That's because perfect. They are great to read. Okay, everybody. We, we'll definitely okay. share that so much. And okay. uh, th thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful day today. Thank you so much, Stan, for your thank time and your knowledge. You. Uh, blown away at some of these bird migrations and nine days of flying straight, or that's just. 
unreal. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, they're much better at using fat than we are, as you can tell from our COVID-22. <laughs> okay, everybody. Um, thanks, Bye. everyone. Have a great day.